नमस्कार सुस्वागतम केम छो आदाबाज वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून आप सभी का टी आर एल के अमृत व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है ए वेरी वॉम वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर द पी आर एल का अमृत व्याख्यान टुडे इज द सिक्सटी सेवेंथ व्याख्यान ऑफ द सेवेंटी फाइव एपिसोड्स सीरीज ऑफ व्याख्यान which is being organized as a part of PRL's 75 years of legacy and history in fundamental physics and space sciences. Established in the year 1947 by the father of Indian space program, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, the PRL's Platinum Jubilee coincides with India's 75 years of independence. Hence, it's a joint celebration of the development of science and technology in India by PRL under the banner of prl ka amrit vyakhya today we have yet another very distinguished vyakhyan karta dr shashank chaturvedi who is the director of institute of plasma research in gandhinagar and he is going to talk to us on the topic fusion and plasma research in india where are we where are we going we greatly appreciate and thank dr shashank for accepting our invitation and joining us today in the PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan which is a part of PRL's Pratyan Jubilee celebration as well as Ajadi Kamrit Mahotsav I now request my colleague uh, Professor Pallam Raju to kindly introduce our Vyakhyan karta to the panel and the webex as well as all the users who have joined us live on the PRL's YouTube channel over to you Professor Pallam <coughs> Thank you, Professor Bharadwaj. It's indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce our speaker uh, for today, Dr. Shashank Chaturvedi. Uh, Dr. Chaturvedi got his B.Tech degree in uh, chemical engineering from IIT Delhi, wherein he was awarded the silver medal for being the first in the department. He then got his PhD in chemical engineering from Princeton University, USA. His PhD work involved the computational study of novel uh, nuclear fusion reactor concept. He was later awarded the Homi Bhabha Science and Technology Award of DAE in 2005. He is a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering and presently a senior professor in the Homi Bhabha National Institute. He has uh, served as the head of computational analysis division in the Bhabha Atomic Research Center in Vishakhapatnam. He is presently serving as the director of the Institute of Plasma Research in Gandhinagar. His research interests include the numerical modeling of pulsed power and plasma systems, including magnetohydrodynamics, radiation hydrodynamics, high speed impact and shock waves, pulsed electromagnetics, high performance computing, theoretical and experimental determination of material properties under extreme conditions and automated processing of signals, voice, image, and video data. It is an honor for me to uh, invite uh, Dr. Chaturvedi to give his uh, Vyakhyan on a very interesting topic, fusion and plasma research in India. Where are we and where are we going? Dr. Chaturvedi, please. Thank you. Let me first thank PRL for giving me this opportunity. <clears throat> I'll just share my presentation. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. You can maybe please press that hide button also. Yeah. yeah. Button. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> now, just a brief introduction to plasmas, although many people at PRL would already be well aware of things. It's the fourth state of matter. And uh, as far as we know, most matter in the universe is in the plasma state. Now, again, for those not familiar with this, it's the fourth state means you, you can start with any solid solid made of any material, let's say ice, heat it, it becomes water, heat it further, it becomes steam in the gaseous state, keep heating it further to temperature of, of a few thousand degrees or higher and becomes a plasma. Now, the <clears throat> what's different here, it's basically that in the norm, in the three states you've seen here, you basically have atoms and molecules, neutral particles. If when it becomes a plasma, the bound electrons which orbit the nuclei, to some extent, they get stripped. So you end up with a mixture of free electrons, of ions, and neutral particles. 
So this mixture is what we call a plasma. It ends up behaving in a very different way as compared to solid, liquid, and gases of the same material. And that's because these charged particles, if you subject them to electromagnetic forces, they respond, unlike neutral particles like atoms or molecules. And so all manipulation of plasmas mostly is done by applying electric or magnetic fields. One thing that really sets plasmas apart from other states of matter is the enormous range of temperatures and densities that you encounter. Uh, just think of uh, ice, for example. Up to zero degrees, that is right from, let's say, from minus 273 up to zero degrees, it's in the solid state, some sort of solid state. So that's just a range of 273 degrees. Water remains in the liquid state from zero to 100. That's just 100 degrees. And then steam remains steam in the gaseous state up to a few thousand degrees. But look at the range of temperatures you can have with the plasma. Starting at a few thousand degrees, which is what corresponds to like uh, something like aurora, it can go up to temperatures of hundreds of millions of degrees, which is what we encounter in fusion and thermonuclear weapons. Similarly, you have things like if you look at density, you again have a, a range of many orders of magnitude. Starting with aurora, which is again low densities, you have flames where the density of the charged particles, the electron density would be pretty low. To put this in perspective, the density of air is around 2.5, 10 to the 19 particles per cc. That's out here. So all these densities that we're dealing with are 1 lakh or 1 billion times lower than that of air. You have neon lights, fluorescent lights, the solar corona, lightning, magnetic confinement fusion, which is the major area of work at IPR, thermonuclear weapons, where the density is also higher and the temperature is also high. And then a different approach to fusion, which is called inertial confinement fusion, where the temperature is anyway 100 million degrees, but the density can be as much as 10 or 100 times that of a solid. So there's an enormous range of densities and temperatures that makes uh, sets apart a plasma from the other states. Now, there are different ways of producing plasmas. You could provide just thermal energy, maybe even a simple burner. In the flame, you have a small region of ionization, very weak ionization, but you do get some plasma there. You can have an electric spark. So by giving electrical energy, so you have an arc between two electrodes that has a plasma. You can have a laser. If you shine it, let's say on a solid, on a thin film, it turns into a plasma for a very short time. It's, that's a pulse plasma. You can also use microwaves. So if you use some kind of, kind of electromagnetic waves, shine them on a gas or air, it breaks down, you get a plasma. So there are so many different ways of producing a plasma. Now, because of this, Now, because of uh, you can have plasmas over a huge range of densities and temperatures, and you can make them out of different materials. You can have any element or mixture of elements and turn it into a plasma. Plasmas find a lot of different kinds of applications. So you can use what, are, what we could call cold or warm plasmas for societal and industrial applications. And if you have very hot plasmas, so, uh, solar sunlight temperatures, you can use them for nuclear fusion. Let's first look at some of the things you can use it for if you have a cold plasma relatively cold. Spacecraft propulsion systems. You know that you launch a spacecraft to use chemical energy. You have boosters which have two chemicals reacting. But once you get up into space uh, to maintain attitude of the uh, satellite, to make small orbital changes over long times, you use plasma thrusters. <clears throat> you, you can have plasma discharge tubes. That's a different one. The things called plasmas for night riding. These are basically used to increase the life of industrial tools. And I'll say a little more about that later. Then you can have neon lamp displays, plasma torches, circuit breakers, which, we, which are very common in industry, even at home. We have miniature circuit breakers and dusty plasmas, which find applications in astrophysics. So these are the, some of the things, some of the applications of cold or what we can call warm plasmas. Coming to hot plasmas, that's a different range altogether because the temperatures now we are talking about are now in the range of 50 or 100 million degrees. Basically, what happens is that the light, some light elements fuse to form heavy elements. And in the process, they release energy. To overcome the repulsive forces between these uh, light elements, let's say hydrogen nuclei, you have to give them a lot of kinetic energy so that as they come together, the kinetic energy gradually gets converted to potential energy. If they come close enough, they fuse. But for that, you need temperatures of about 100 million or more. What are the advantages? Why are we doing this? One is there are no carbon emissions or very small carbon emissions. The fuels are abundant. It's basically an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium. And another isotope of hydrogen called tritium, which can be produced by breeding from lithium. So both these are available. Uh, compared to other nuclear uh, power generation techniques through fission, there are no long-lived radioactive waste. And because the stored energy at any given time in the system is very low, they are inherently safe. The trouble is making this happen. That's where the whole problem starts. Let's look at a star. 
because those are natural fusion reactors like we have the sun the problem is the advantage stars have is they operate in the vacuum of space so it's a very hot plasma but it's got nothing surrounding it it can freely move around so there's nothing constraining it there but when we try to do the same thing on earth this very hot plasma has to be kept away from the surrounding from air what we typically do is to put it inside a stainless steel vessel but the problem is these things have to operate at uh, low pressures under high vacuum and then you have to keep it there you have to keep the plasma away from the stainless steel vessel that is containing it how do you do that in the sun there's no problem because gravity holds the whole thing together so you have gravitational confinement but to do the same thing on the on the earth to keep the plasma away from the stainless steel wall takes a lot of technologies so let me come to those now now there are lots of critical technologies i'll try to explain how, why we need them and what kind of things we need the first thing is to keep the plasma away from the walls of the uh, from the stainless steel walls we put it inside what is called a magnetic cage now that's basically because the plasma consists of charged particles so if i have a magnetic field structure there the plasma easily moves along the field lines but it can't move perpendicular to the field lines so we have we end up creating some we have to create some kind of magnetic structure these red uh, shapes that you can see they are what we call toroidal field coils that provides the main magnetic field and the yellow thing that you can see inside here that's the plasma so we need to create a magnetic cage and the plasma threads the space inside the magnetic cage and if you look at the right top this part you can see the dots here the green and the red dots are basically charged particles moving around in the space between the magnets okay fine so we have produced a magnetic cage where we can keep the plasma but we have to create the plasma and to heat it up to high temperatures how do we do that you have to continuously heat it to make up the heat leakage because the plasma is hot 100 million it keeps leaking by conduction convection and radiation so what we require for that are megawatt class microwaves and particle beams so there are two ways of heating a plasma you can either apply let's say rf waves in the tens of megahertz range you can have microwaves you can have millimeter waves and if you shine them at the plasma the charged particles tend to absorb energy from these by different processes one more thing i mentioned was that these plasmas have a density tokamak plasmas have a density of around 1 lakh times lower than air density so you must first have an ultra high vacuum system in which to put it fill the gas that means i need ultra high vacuum systems which means i need high performance vacuum pumps and i need special materials which are compatible with hydrogen but don't start storing it up and don't don't start allow gases to leak into the plasma now having poured so much energy into the plasma you have to remember the plasma is continuously losing energy just like the sun loses energy by conduction convection radiation this energy has to be received somewhere if i let this heat re reach the walls of the stainless steel vessel the vessel will get damaged very quickly number 2 it's not just the damage and now you know the stainless steel consists of iron chromium nickel and so on these elements will find their way into the plasma now i am trying to create a pure hydrogen plasma deuterium and tritium but if you have chromium and iron and nickel coming in there they'll start radiating energy very rapidly so what we do is to create a different kind of magnetic structure uh, which is called a diverter in a diverter all this heat that's coming out and the particles that are flowing out of the plasma they are received on a solid surface that solid surface is then subjected to enormous heat loads just to give you a perspective you know that when a missile reenters the atmosphere it is subjected to heat loads of around 10 megawatts per meter square that range 10 to 20 the same thing happens to say a space shuttle coming back now those things get away by putting tiles on the surface and the tiles have to withstand that heat for just about 3 minutes while the reentry is happening in a tokamak in a fusion reactor this has to operate continuously so that enormous heat load of 10 to 20 meter megawatts per meter square has to be handled continuously that requires special materials it requires different joining technologies different manufacturing technologies so the whole range of technologies that come out there okay now we require also remote handling remember that finally the product from this reaction is going to be 14 mev neutrons so once <clears throat> uh, these neutrons come out they hit various materials that are surrounding the structure and so on surrounding the reactor and they tend to activate them to some extent there are some gamma rays which come out and so on so it is not possible for a human being to be inside when the machine is operating also the tokamak shape if i just go back you've seen this complicated shape the magnetic cage to hand, to repair anything inside it you have tiles you have different kinds of surfaces you have to keep replacing these components once in a while whenever they get damaged now you cannot do you cannot easily access things inside the shape is very complex so you need complex remote handling structures and these remote handling systems are more complex than in space and underwater applications okay let's move on to the next one that's cryogenics the magnetic cage that we produce requires a, to produce a magnetic field around say 5 tesla or so that kind of range inside a very large volume of many cubic meters 
that can only be done using superconducting magnets. If we were started using copper magnets, the heat dissipation in the copper would quickly consume far more power than you, than you could ever produce with the, with, fish, uh, with the fusion. So we need cryogenics. We need to cool down the superconducting magnets to very low temperatures, which go down to say 4.2 Kelvin or so. So we need large cryogenic systems. Now plasma, these plasmas that we produce, they are what are called collagenless plasmas. So they, and they are very low in mass. Their densities are very low. I told you that uh, the density is about one lakh times lower than that of air. So the, for the slightest force imbalance, electromagnetic force imbalance, they tend to move very rapidly. They can move in microsecond time scales. We need some system which can quickly measure the position of the plasma, the shape of the plasma, and then provide feedback to push it back to the normal position. So we need high speed data acquisition control systems. Now, finally, this whole structure, the magnets and all the rest of it has to be, remember it's superconducting. It is at 4.5 Kelvin or 4.2 Kelvin. The whole thing has to be enclosed inside of, of something like a thermos flask. What we do is to enclose the whole thing inside something called a cryostat. There's a picture of a cryostat out here. It's basically a stainless steel structure, which encloses the entire assembly. So this involves what is called uh, heavy engineering. Now the plasma that you've got in there, that you cannot stick things into the plasma for the most part, because they'll get damaged and they'll make the plasma dirty. So the way we measure what's happening inside the plasma, what it's doing is to me uh, measure whatever is coming out of it. We have therefore a whole range of sensors, right from microwaves to infrared to visible ultraviolet X-rays and so on. So the entire range of radiation electromagnetic band has to be monitored. And from that, and of course, there are other quantities also like the magnetic field, those are measured. Based on that, we try to understand what's happening inside. Finally, to drive, you, uh, you remember the magnetic cage, we've got superconducting electromagnets. We have to pass a large current in the electromagnets. In the same way, we've got high power microwave systems, millimeter wave and so on. They have to be driven. All this requires very powerful power supplies, high voltage systems, high current systems. In fact, power supplies tend to make up a good part of the cost of a fusion reactor. So these are again a very major area of technology development. Okay. So to summarize, these are the various technologies that go into tokamax. <clears throat> you have advanced materials like blanket, things which face the, uh, with the plasma, power engineering, RF and microwaves, diagnostics, because you have to measure what's happening, different kinds of beam technologies, cryogenics and superconductors, and robotics. So this just, just gives you a feel for the kinds of things that have to be developed. Now, there's nothing in these technologies in any one of them which has not been used elsewhere. What is special about fusion machines is they're all there together in one place. That is what makes fusion machines so complicated. Just to give you a perspective or the, a kind of feel for the kinds of numbers we have, in the ITER machine, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor that's been built in France, India being a partner there, look at some of the magnets that are used. There's a central solenoid, which is 13 meters high and weighs 1,000 tons. The 18 toroidal field coils, these brown colored things, 17 meters high, 360 tons each. And six polaroidal field coils, each of a diameter of 8 to 24 meters, each weighing 200 to 400 tons. So everything in a fusion reactor is big. That is something that we have to remember. Now, before I go into the domestic program, let me just tell you briefly about the contributions we're making to an international effort. The Almost the entire industrialized world has come together to build a single, the first fusion reactor in France. That's called ITER. Now, the Indian contribution to that is a national effort, which is a major effort and participation from DAE as well as from industry. Now, it's a matter of pride for us that Indian in-kind commitments, the things that we make and supply there, have so far been completed according to schedule. So let me just give you, show you a small video of the things that we're doing. I won't talk there. You can just look at uh, the captions there. Yeah. On the left are these yellow colored things. These are technologies we are developing, systems that we are making and supplying to ITER. On the right are things we have to do in our domestic program. Those are not things we are supplying to ITER. The first thing is the cryostat, around 3,800 tons of steel. It has been made in small segments. It's so big, it can't be made in one place. It's being made at LNT in Hazira, close to Surat. It's manufactured in pieces, and the pieces are shipped to, sent to France by ship and assembled there. In wall shielding. I told you about the 14 MeV neutrons that come out. So you need shielding to protect the outside components from that. That's also being done in India. We are providing RF, high power RF sources. The tubes themselves come from the US, but the rest of the system is made in India and then supplied to France. The cooling water system that's being made by LNT Chennai, uh, Chennai and Kirloskar. 
cryo distribution because you have liquid helium being supplied from very from a very far away cryo plant up to the actual tokamak much of it is india's responsibility not all of it but a good part of it on the power supplies they have been developed in india different kinds of power supplies supplied there not just to iter but also to other facilities there's a diagnostic neutral beam that we are making again first of a kind many of these things are first of a kind the first time they are being done and certain diagnostics i'll come out with these now in addition to these things that we are supplying for iter so we've had to learn those technologies developing those systems testing them now there are certain things we are not supplying so we had to develop all those technologies indigenously so we've been developing a range of technologies for the domestic program now these involve two kinds one is fusion technologies the second is plasma technologies for societal and industrial benefit i'll come to that now but before i get to the technologies part let me just talk about a tokamax just two slides on these the first you remember that ipr had started uh, built the first indian tokamax that was called aditya in 2016 Uh, uh, we commissioned a new, essentially a new tokamak called Aditya Upgrade, which had some of the parts from Aditya, but there were many other things. It was stripped down to the base and then built up again. So there are lots of changes in there. Now this machine basically operates throughout the year, around 15 discharges a day, typically from Tuesday to Friday, and keeping one day for maintenance and so on. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, now I'll just like to highlight one of the novel things. There are lots of things to talk about. I just want to show some of these things. we have developed along with brc vizag what we call an induction coil gun that is for injecting particles into the tokamak very rapidly at high velocities now this is uh, let me just show you a video of the lab testing of this thing this is a high speed video of particles small particles of lithium titanate which we wanted to inject into the tokamak into aditya we then did this experiment which has relevance for the iter project injecting such particles at high velocity into a tokamak for the first time Let me just show you a video of Aditya, high-speed video of the Aditya Tokamak. Yeah. Now, right now you can't see anything. You can see a small glow out here. That's basically the part where the plasma is touching the outer surface. The plasma itself is too hot to radiate in the visible range. So what you see is only the part where the plasma touches the boundary. Now, at some point, you'll see small particles coming in. They'll start glowing, and they will then radiate. You can now see the particles coming in. These are small pellets, small powder-like things. They come in. They radiate a flash. the plasma cools down and finishes off so this is one high speed video of uh, this experiment on tokamak which is we did for the first time why is it important the reason is in iter and in all big machines these plasmas are very unstable they tend to disrupt they tend to destroy themselves very violently so uh, now you try to control that a lot of the feedback control system tries to prevent these disruptions still even with all the effort you put in once in a while there is a tendency for the plasma to break up because of instabilities under certain conditions if you sense it it will be nice to throw inject small particles or a powder which can radiate away part of the energy of the plasma so the plasma cools down a bit that tends to reduce the instabilities so that is what we call disruption mitigation in these plasmas so this is something that has been done for the first time in a tokamak let me come to the sst tokamak sst1 this the because there is a superconducting tokamak each campaign at least has to be something like a month because you need several days to cool down the cold mass to superconducting temperatures so the experimental campaigns are limited to 2 to 3 per annum once it starts operating you have to operate it around the clock there's a 25 ton cold mass that goes down to low temperatures so you need about 14 days to cool it down we need a warm up time of about 8 days with the experimental window of operation of 9 to 10 days there's a hydrogen circular plasma operation that we've done so far at a total field of 1.5 tesla we are planning shape plasma operation in the future okay let me now come to one of the high heat flux things we got a facility called the high heat flux test facility i mentioned earlier that plasma uh, that diverter configuration in tokamaks involves developing a material a, a structure a, a plate which can receive very high heat loads so we have we try out different geometries different materials and so on now how do you test whether this will be able to handle these things so we've set up a high heat flux test facility where we use a 200 kilowatt electron beam to generate the kinds of heat fluxes you actually encounter in tokamax this is one of the few such facilities in the world let me show you a small video of this
you can see the electron beam shining on a target you can raster it on the target you can subject it to different kinds of heat loads you can produce very high pulse loads or steady state loads okay i'll stop here now so this is the facility we use for testing different kinds of diabetic configurations let me uh, move to a different topic because fusion reactor is going to generate 14 mv neutrons and they are, it's not easy to get us any source of 14 mv neutrons they don't normally occur in nature so we've set up an accelerator based 14 mv dt neutron generator at ipr it's been commissioned recently we are now waiting for regulatory approval now just to give you some numbers here it will have a it will have a beam energy this basically involves a deuterium beam being accelerated to maximum energy of 300 kev and with a maximum beam current of 20 milliamps with a 25 mm diameter uh, it is it hits a tritiated target a titanium tritiated target so when it hits a dt neut fusion neutrons take place and you get a beam of neutrons and that can work at steady state the number we've designed it for is 5 10 to the 12 neutrons per second which will put it amongst the top few facilities in the world for su with such kind of neutron generation rates in the trial runs we've done before commissioning we've already produced 7 10 to the 11 neutrons per second now we are waiting for regulatory approval from aerb before we go up to full parameter operation let me come to another technology that's been developed because everywhere it's important that we develop the technologies that will be needed in fusion reactors otherwise we we would remain permanently dependent on uh, uh, supplies abroad so among the various things that we've done for tokamax is to develop an indigenous cryosorption cryo pump which is currently called agastya 400 the entire thing was has been developed in ipr from scratch uh, starting with design different kinds of modeling design analysis fabrication coating of sorbents installation testing uh, we had an mou with sac in 2017 under which we supplied three such cryo pumps to sac and they've been accepted recently we have, that mou has been extended because now sac and some other isro labs also require slightly larger opening cryo pumps so that those will have to be developed so these are not just catering to our own requirements for example we have developed one for the high heat facility i just showed another one for sst1 it's been mounted there we are developing a xenon cryo pump which will be of use for say plasma thrusters and so on so it's a whole range of things which are coming out of one technology development there there are also an activity on developing high temperature superconductors sst makes use of low temperature superconductors like niobium titanium there's of course other options of using niobium tin like an eater but apart from that you must all have seen in the news that more and more people are coming out with high temperature superconductors because they will be much cheaper and simpler to operate and for so for future fusion machines we have to start looking at hts superconductors we've done a small we have a small program in this area currently what we have developed is a 1.1 tesla pulsed magnet operating at 77 kelvin uh, a 0.2 tesla magnet operating continuously dc a 1 tesla operating at 13 kelvin at steady state and a 200 gauss dc operation a large a much larger coil 540 by 350 mm that was done for some external application so we have a steady state program here to gradually build up this capability uh, now a lot of the activities that are going on for the fusion program and for other applications of plasmas and basic research involve a lot of computing uh, over the past 3 years i think slightly more we've had a facility called antya that's a one petaflop high performance computing facility which is a mix of cpu and gpu operations we are currently because that this is now being used almost at its full capacity in fact there are lots of jobs that are being we have something like 200 users some of most of them within ipr but some of them uh, who are people who are collaborating with ipr so now the usage especially of the gpu servers has gone beyond capacity many people are denied opportunity to run their jobs so we are upgrading the gpu part of this thing so we are hoping that we will be able to add once we go through the entire process maybe a four or five petaflop capacity in terms of gpus okay but now i have been talking so far mostly about the fusion energy part now this is only one application of plasmas like i mentioned in the beginning plasma is very enormously in terms of the composition the temperature and the pressure different combinations of these things can lead to different applications so on the societal and industrial application side we've been doing three categories of work one is something that has reached a mature level things uh, the technologies which have been patented we developed a system or a technology done tech transfer to private industry so that's at a mature level the other things which are still at the technology demonstrator stage and third a third type which is r and d stage so let i'll just give you a quick flavor of these things there's no time to you know cover all these things extensively i'll just give you a quick flavor but before i get into the actual applications 
let me just mention something when we develop all these things from scratch especially at the r&d stage we need to have a lot of modeling numerical modeling to understand what's going on now there are many issues in predicting the behavior of low temperature plasmas fusion plasmas are also difficult to predict so are low temperature plasmas the first part is in low temperature plasmas the plasma physics and chemistry are closely interlinked you can barely separate them out because they're dealing at low temperatures so basically now what does plasma physics involve it will involve something like the modeling of the electromagnetic field combined with things like joule heating of the plasma because there's a current flowing in the plasma you have things like electron collision reactions and so on so if you take a particular problem like say plasma combustion plasma assisted combustion of a novel chemical reaction this is where the, where the plasma physics part comes in you have lots of charged species excited species there can be ionic wind and so on then you have to worry about the flame dynamics because the plasma is assisting combustion somewhere that will involve the flame dynamics extinction ignition flame speed flame instability and on the third side you have chemical kinetics the normal chemical kinetics reaction pathways reaction rates the rate of heat release so this is basically it, it it's at the border line of three complicated things that's why modeling these things becomes pretty complicated let me give you an example if you inter, uh, we have something called a plasma activated water which i'll come to later if you just look at the kinds of species that are formed in this this basically involves some kind of a plasma a plasma torch a small one shining on say a beaker full of water when you do that see the species that are forming firstly there are the primary species because the plasma is in air so you have all the species that can come from air you have n various species o various species mixtures of these o h o excited states various things then you have secondary reactive species no no2 no3 h2o2 stuff like that and then once you get inside the liquid phase again a whole range of species so if you want to understand how plasma activated water would behave what kind of species will be there in what concentrations any modeling has to take into account the reaction kinetics and the thermo thermodynamics of all these species that is what makes life pretty complicated look at another uh, example so if you have plasma assisted combustion which i'll come to later you have plasma discharges which can, uh, once you have a discharge you have temperature increase so it has thermal effects you have ions and electrons radicals different species excited species so their kinetics and then ionic wind fuel fragments transport of all these things all these together is what has to go into modeling of combustion enhancement by a plasma so that's what makes the modeling of these things pretty complicated but it's fun also from the research point of view and it makes it a very good uh, uh, these very good topics for phd uh, problems going to a very different parameter range if you look at shock waves and detonations some of them which are assisted by plasmas some of them without it even in any detonation whenever an explosive is detonates you do get some plasma formation there also there are certain applications of plasmas where you want to study partially degenerate plasmas these can be produced by explosive driven shock loading on porous materials you can for example start with aluminum foam at a density which is 1/10 to 1/100th of normal density it's a very porous material if you subject that to a shock by a produced by an explosive you get a low temperature plasma you have explosive driven switches for pulse fire applications these involve partially ionized detonation products now in all these problems of this type the density of different species and the mole fractions of different species they change over orders of magnitude ranging from solid to a gas so again the modeling of these things has to be able to handle on the one hand gas like phenomena so you have to use numerical techniques that would correspond to a gas but you also have a solid somewhere okay now let me talk, uh, say something about the technologies that we have developed in the societal front now just a quick overview plasma technologies have, have applications in the environment in the energy sector industrial strategic that is space and defense and social and health i won't go into uh, these things i'll be showing you a few examples but just to cover one of the, a few of these this plasma night lighting which is used to increase the life of industrial tools so it's out here you can use plasmas to improve the properties of textiles we have developed for example a software called deep cxr where you can use uh, artificial intelligence to automatically diagnose chest x rays i'll come to that later you can use plasmas to produce nano powders which has industrial application uh, applications and you can have plasma pyrolysis for disposing of waste in an eco friendly way uh, an emerging area that we've just started getting into recently is production of green hydrogen from waste so that's something that we've just started just shows a picture of the technology transfers and installations of ipr systems over the country so just some, some names here okay currently we are developing a 5 tons per day plasma system for disposal of biomedical waste at the homi baba cancer hospital in varanasi 
Now, uh, develop, this whole system is going to be developed in, 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 in IPR first, in a, a center we have called FCIPT in Gandhinagar. So that whole thing is, uh, it's already designed, many of the parts are tested. The whole thing will be integrated here, tested, and then we'll transfer it to Varanasi. Just to show you a quick view of this thing, plasma pyrolysis is basically, can be used for waste disposal and for energy recovery from waste, what is called waste to energy now. It is based on IPR's efforts that this entire process, plasma pyrolysis, was approved by the Ministry of, uh, of <coughs> Environment, MOEF and CC, for disposal of biomedical waste. And it has been notified in the Gazette of India in 2016. Now, what that means is basically you pour the way, you uh, supply waste, you feed it to a chamber where you have plasma torches producing a lot of energy. Why do we use plasma torches? Now, normally you know that waste disposal is done by incinerators. The problem with incinerators is you just have chemical reactions. So the temperature does not go very high. So sometimes, apart from disposing of the waste, you can produce very toxic materials like dioxins and furans. With a plasma, the temperature is at least 5,000 degrees and more like 10 to 20,000 degrees with these torch plasmas. So you get almost no uh, toxic materials coming out of it. You get very clean materials. And whatever is the inorganic waste in that, it comes out as a sludge at the bottom. Let me just show you a quick video. Recently, just about, I think, a few months back, We've tested the plasma torches, you know, because the plasma systems must work continuously. This is a plant for disposing of biomedical waste. It will actually be catering in the long run to all the biomedical waste from Varanasi, not just to the particular hospital we are talking about. So it has to work reliably. So we've done recently very extended testing of our plasma torches at FCIPT. Let me show you a video. Yeah. So we've done a testing for 122 hours, 120 hours of 100 kilowatt graphite torches, plasma torches, developed at IPR. These are the graphite electrodes. So this is something that we just tested. It's the first time a 100 kilowatt torch has been developed and tested in India. Okay, coming to a different area, you, plasmas can be used for uh, treating textiles, for improving the properties. So exact, for example, for eco-friendly textile processing, the advantage of this thing is it can do, it can, uh, we've developed an inline system. That is, you have a cloth being produced in a factory and the plasma system can be put in line so it can become part of the manufacturing process. Now, we have installed a prototype system like this in Surat. There's a man-made textile research association. Just like in Ahmedabad, there's Atira. In Surat, there's Mantra. Now, the advantage of this thing is in textile processing, it minimizes water usage. It improves the uptake of dyes to the conventional process. So the plasma treatment modifies the surface of the textile. So it is e easily able to take up dyes. It is an eco-friendly process because it avoids the use of acids. Normally, acids are used to remove the bags and so on from textile surfaces. Here, there's no such requirement. We've also transferred the technology and, for example, it's being applied particularly in Surat for improving the bonding with jerry. Another application is in the wool area. Now, you, uh, you might know that 100% uh, angora wool is very warm, but uh, you cannot make 100% angora wool clothing. Uh, clothing uh, you have to mix certain things with it. That's because the fiber is very slippery, so the wool keeps shedding it. So we developed a plasma treatment thing which modifies the surface of the angora wool. So with that 100% angora wool can be uh, 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 fabric can be produced. Now you can see an example here. There's a large plasma processing system for angora wool that's in installed in Uttarakhand, and also we've transferred the technology to industry. It's basically supporting the empowerment of rural women. Let me now come to another application in the area of artificial intelligence. Now we developed the AI tools that we are showing here, basically for application for tokamax and for understanding plasma experiments. Actually, we were trying to predict. Uh, disruptions occurring in our own tokamax. But in the process of that, we developed this expertise. So we thought we can apply that in the medical sector. Now, this has happened over the past few years. Currently now, that has led to a program where IPR software, AI software called Deep CXR. It is at the heart of a program uh, uh, coordinated by ICMR, the Indian Council for Medical Research. There are 20 institutions all over India, hospitals, medical research centers, and so on, who are supplying us chest X-ray images after diagnosis. So they do their own diagnosis, they do lab tests, and based on that, they upload on the ICMR website. 
we download from there and we use it to train our deep CSR software. Why are we doing this? Now, our software gives us specificity and sensitivity more than 90% on a test data set. This is much better than the AI system they got from other BRICS, you know, the, uh, these five countries that make up the BRICS. So they were able to get a software from South Africa, but it didn't work. It had been trained on South African data. It gave very low accuracy in Indian data, around 30%. So this is our own system trained on Indian data. So we have so far got about 34,000 images and they, they keep coming in. So we keep improving our software. And almost every week we release a new version of the software to these labs. So that keeps getting improved. The software is pretty fast. The training takes time. So we do that on a high performance computing system. But once it's trained, the actual diagnosis, uh, identifying whether an image is normal or abnormal, let's say somebody has TB or cancer, and identifying uh, even marking out the area where the abnormality is located, that happens very fast. Let me show you an actual video. So this is the actual software running. It runs on JPEG images, which are the uh, how we get the uh, chest X-ray files. You see, it's able to locate, localize where the abnormality is and if it, whether it's abnormal versus normal. In the future, we are going to train it to even distinguish between, say, TB and uh, other things, pneumonia and so on. Currently, the data we are getting from them is diagnosed only as normal and abnormal. So this program has been coordinated by ICMR. The software is ours. Let me come to another very different application, again, in the medical field. We've developed a, an atmospheric plasma jet. This video that you see here shows it's a cold plasma. You can basically, it's like a pencil. You can hold it in your hand. You can shine it on your finger. There's no heat. It's like a cold plasma. So it's a low power portable plasma jet. Currently it has, you know, around the world, people have used these plasma jets for various applications. What we are doing currently is we are working with Actrec. That's a part of the Tata Memorial Center in Bombay, studying if it can be used for treatment of oral cancer. So that's an R&D process. Animal trials have already been underway. Now we are trying to gradually increase the size of the trials and go forward. We are also working with AIMS in Delhi, studying if this can be used for treatment of brain cancers. Or at least you know that uh, there are some people who suffer from epileptic attacks, basically because of cancers. Now, those tumors can be removed. But it's very important that after you remove the tumor, the, the uh, I think it's called that bed on which the tumor is, that has to be cleaned. There should be no cancerous cells left. What we are trying to study is with AIMS is whether the cleaning, if you do it with uh, plasma jets, will kill those cancerous cells, but leave the healthy cells uh, unaltered. Again, this has various other applications. We recently started a project on uh, sterilization of root canal. You know that those of you who had root canal treatment, uh, it needs to be sterilized at the bottom because after that, they seal it off. So people around the world have used it for sterilization of the, of the root. We are uh, trying that with some medical research center. Remember that IPR cannot do medical uh, research. We can only work on the plasma part. So we need medical partners who can do this part. We've also transferred some of the technology to industry. Let me come to the plasma activated water. Now, basically, what is it? What you have is, let me show you a video of that. So this is a plasma torch, a small plasma torch, a multiple of them, and then you have uh, water. So this produces reactive species, reactive oxygen nitrogen species inside the water. Now, because of this change, we've developed a low-cost technique to produce PAW and to tune the composition so we can play around with it. It's already been given some good results. We work with some uh, people in the dairy industry and tried it for treatment of uh, low-cost disinfection of food-related containers. It's turned out that it's, it, gives, it gives quite a lot of saving in terms of cost. It has lots of other applications. For example, some work that we have published recently, there's a PhD student's problem. We found that if you treat seeds, pea seeds, in plasma-activated water for a certain amount of time, the germination improves. Why does it happen? Basically, it improves, it changes the surface properties of the seeds. The, so the, the contact angle between water and the seed. So the water uptake improves into the seed. It's able to get in. So with that, the seed germination improves. You get more uh, uh, chlorophyll formation and so on. This work has been published. So now we are exploring with some uh, agricultural research centers whether they can try out this thing and see how much it can actually improve in real life. Let me come to the problem we have recently started working on. It's still at a very early stage. Now, but it's been developed abroad. The, uh, the industry is in China and I think uh, one company in the US which has developed this. It's a process called plasma ignition. Now, why do we, why are we interested in this? The reason is today you know that uh, coal fired power plants, they have a problem because in the daytime, all the solar power comes on, stay, uh, uh, the supply increases, they go to full power. So in the daytime, many of the coal power plants have to operate much below the design capacity, some maybe 50 or 60% of the design capacity. It's, they don't easily operate there. Sometimes the, the furnace pinches. 
The second is if a furnace quenches for whatever reason, to restart it in the normal way in a coal-fired power plant can take a few hours. That is because coal does not burn at low temperatures. It requires a temperature of around 300 degrees. So the startup of a furnace, a coal-fired furnace, can take a few hours. Now, using plasma ignition, what you do is to attach a plasma device. You, you know, into the furnace, you're feeding coal powder, very fine powder and air. If you attach a plasma torch here, while it is being fed, the coal particles are coming in with a diameter of around 50 to 100 microns. The thermal shock when they hit the plasma, the plasma is very hot, it breaks it down into part much smaller particles, 5 to 10 microns. So the surface area goes up, which means they can burn faster. The second is, because it's very hot there, the volatile materials inside the coal particles, they come to the surface and they become partially volatilized. Now it's the volatiles that actually burn in coal. The rest of it is ash, which doesn't burn. So we've, we've done some early studies in this. We now try to work with actual industry to see, we've made a small scale thing. Let me just show you a video of that. So this is where we put in a plasma torch and coal and air are being fed and it's improving the combustion. So we study to, oh God, we study to what extent this can improve the performance. We are not uh, trying to uh, consulting with BHEL because they are the manufacturers of burners in India and seeing if we can do some studies on actual burners, small scale burners. Okay. Another application of plasmas is to increase the component life in industry of using plasma nitriding. What plasma nitrogen does is it, you, it produces a layer of a thin layer of nitrogen in the subsurface of steel components, just a few hundred microns thick. That increases the hardness of the surface, increases the wear resistance and corrosion resistance. So the life of the industrial component increases. And it's very uniform. It could produce a very uniform layer, unlike other methods of produ producing nitride. Also, plasmas can be used for producing different kinds of coating. Let me just show you a video. So we have a mechanical structure which makes this component rotate. So plasmas can be used for different, produce different kinds of coatings inside different things. Let me come in, come again to a different area, something that we started about two years back in a very small way. And now we are trying to find partners in the aerospace industry or in the car industry who might be interested in these. Now, just to give you the background here, 65% of the engine power in highway trucks is spent in overcoming air drag. So if you can reduce the drag, that will significantly improve the fuel efficiency. Now, the aerodynamic drag itself has two parts. One is a viscous drag and a pressure drag. If you look at a heavy vehicle like a truck moving at highway speeds, 70, 80, 100 kilometers per hour, the Reynolds number is large. So viscous forces tend to be pretty small. So it's basically the form drag. Now, the pressure drag on the vehicle front, if you've seen trucks traveling, you'll see there's always a sloping thing that they put between the driver's cabin and the container or something at the back. Now that tends to reduce, that makes the surface more streamlined. So you reduce the drag on the front. The back surface is where the whole problem is. The shape of the cargo carrying rear portion is boxy. Because you've seen containers, they like boxes. They have many sharp edges. So it's easy to handle, but the pressure drag tends to be large on that part. Companies like Honda and GM, they've taken out patents on plasma used for drag reduction in these cars. What they do is very small surfaces of the truck, very small parts, you put a small plasma actuator using something called dielectric barrier discharges. It's a different way of producing plasmas. And with very small areas like this, very small power consumption, you can reduce the drag significantly. At IPR, what we've done is to set up a small wind tunnel. We didn't actually have any experience in aerodynamics earlier. We set up a small wind tunnel. Now, what we expect to see is this. If you have an airfoil, like this red one, if you have air flowing from the left towards the right, the flow tends to separate. What you're seeing are the streamlines here. You can visualize the streamlines the flow tends to separate and that leads to turbulence here, which enhances the drag. If you have a plasma on, what we expect to see is that the flow gets attached to the surface. The streamlines get attached, which reduces the turbulence, therefore reduces the drag. I'll just show you a quick video where we, we've also put these plasma actuators on an airfoil inside a wind tunnel and we inject smoke. That's the standard way of visualizing uh, flow. You'll see the how the streamlines get attached. So we've done a proof of principle uh, experiment here. You see that here. On the top surface, when you see the violet glow, that's when the plasma is there, you can see the flow is attached. The streamlines are parallel to the surface. When the violet glow goes, like now, the flow separates. So this continuously under testing in a wind tunnel. Again, we'll switch on here. Again, the flow uh, attaches. Again, when we switch it off, the flow will separate. Here. So we've done a proof of principle. We've even done some early measurements of the kind of change in drag and load, uh, drag and lift. But we still have to, now we have to work with professionals, people working in this area to actually do professional level measurements. But it's in a very nice area of work. We're doing computer simulations in this and we're doing small scale experiments. Again, a very exciting area for PhD problems.
let me come to another application that's using plasma antennas for stealth applications now you know that normal antennas are uh, normally they're metallic structures you can have a dish antenna you can have a wire or whatever now those are things that you can't change easily so you cannot uh, cannot have rapidly electronically steerable antennas which can fit on land vehicles or spe especially if you're trying to radiate low frequencies the lambda becomes very large so the antennas tend to become very large with plasma antennas and plasma antenna arrays you can do you can rapidly reconfigure them because the plasma can be created and destroyed very rapidly let me just show you one video uh, where a, it's a it's a simple thing it's like a tube light where we create a plasma and we remove it and it is act receiving fm transmissions normal fm transmissions let me just show you a quick video with an audio So you can see that as you reduce the plasma length, once it becomes a non-resident, you stop receiving transmissions. It becomes very noisy. You, it's not just one antenna. You can create arrays. You can rapidly steer them, which has a lot of applications. Okay. Now I've so far talked, just given you a quick overview of what we've been doing so far. There are many other things, and we would welcome any of you to come over to IPR and see these things. What are we planning for the future? So I'll just take five minutes to cover what we are planning in the future and end. What we've done is recently we worked out a 25-year roadmap for the three-pronged R&D program of indigenous development. So the emphasis is on developing everything indigenously. The first component is nuclear fusion for producing power, of course. But along the way, a slightly less demanding job is to produce medical isotopes using the neutrons that come out from fusion machines. The second component is societal and industrial applications of plasmas. A third is we have to invest in basic research, which will develop a facilitated development of futuristic technologies. So we also have some ideas there. Now, let's I'll just quickly run over what we plan here in component one fusion. We plan the construction of two nuclear fusion devices. The, uh, followed by the start of demonstrate a full fusion reactor, a power reactor construction around 2050, so 25 years from now. Also, to facilitate all this, indigenous development of the entire range of enabling fusion technologies. Everything should be done in India. India doesn't mean IPR. It means IPR plus all the R&D institutions, plus academia, plus industry, most important. Now, so this is what you're planning on the fusion side and societal applications. On the directed basic research that I mentioned for futuristic technologies, one of the things, not all of them, we are, we are thinking about, we've already started a program uh, over the past few years of developing plasma thrusters. That's basically a, an automatic outgrowth because we have, we've had a lot of studies on basic research, PhD problems on interactions of plasmas or different kinds of plasmas with RF at different frequencies. As a natural consequence of that, we decided to develop what we call a helicon plasma thruster, which is actually much more efficient as compared to Hall thrusters, which are conventionally used. Uh, this has been underway, I think, for the past three years or so. We've currently developed a five kilo kilowatt system. The helicon power is five kilowatts. Achieved a stress of 70 to 80 millinewtons typically. Developing a 10 kilowatt helicon source now currently. Let me just show you a quick video of that. So the video is basically as you ramp up the RF power, the helicon power, the plasma glow comes out. It goes into a vacuum chamber because finally you're simulating how this thruster will work in space. So there's a big test chamber for doing all that with some measurement and so on. Okay, now why are we getting into this? The point is, if you look at the long-term space programs of many different countries, they are thinking of nuclear plus electric propulsion, plasma propulsion for deep space missions. Now in these things, the trip time is anything from a few months to a few years. If you're going to Mars, if you're going beyond that, or even if you're trying to have cargo missions to the moon, uh, you want that requires the plasma thrusters driven by nuclear reactors. It cannot be done by solar power. Why? Basically because the power levels required here at 100 kilowatts to 1 megawatt. Now, without a nuclear reactor, you would require very large solar panels and massive batteries. They have their own challenges, making these big things. And as you move away from the sun, the solar panels will progressively become less efficient. And also the structure would become very complicated. The spacecraft mass for one thing would go up. So there's a plot that I've shown here, which is taken from somewhere. If you, this is the electrical power on the x on the y-axis and the operational time. So you can see that if you have operational times of a month or more, or power levels of a megawatt or more, nuclear reactor-driven plasma thrusters are really the only way. 
and this has come out of other studies. These are not our studies. These are published. And in this, there's a particular concept called Vesemar, which is a helicon plasma coupled with ICRH heating, ion cyclotron heating. The advantage of these things is they are electrodeless. So there's nothing to wear out there. And they can produce very high specific impulse, right up to 20,000 seconds or more. Because they, they see, this is basically happening because there's a huge plasma exhaust velocity, which can go up to 50 kilometers per second. So this is why long term we are thinking of these things. The nuclear reactor would not be done at IPR. Some other unit in DA would do that. But we can focus on the plasma thruster part. Okay. We're also doing some work on uh, electromagnetic aircraft launch systems, small scale for UAVs. Why are we doing that? Because IPR has a lot of capability in developing electromagnets, normal copper electromagnets, and in high, high current and high power power supplies. So the main thing in the emails is these two things. So we are doing some prototype studies. We'll be working on that. In the future, again, under our mega science uh, plan, something that is proposed, you know, uh, you might be aware that the PSA's office, the principal scientific advisor's office, is coordinating a mega science vision for India. One of the things we propose there, not as only an IPL thing, but as a collaborative thing, is to develop a Paul Penning Mamba trap for beryllium mines, basically for quantum spin induced entanglement. So the idea is eventually, can we make quant uh, quantum traps which would be used in quantum computers? And IPR, why is IPR having a role there? That's because we have a lot of experience with non-neutral plasmas. So, and in producing high magnetic fields. So these things would require something like four to eight Tesla fields along the axis. So that's why we feel we can contribute in some areas. We would need collaborators in other areas. Okay. So finally, what kind of R&D will we need for Atmanirbalta for having a full indigenous program in making fusion machines, in the fusion technologies, societal applications, and directed uh, basic research. We need to develop an entire ecosystem, indigenous ecosystem, for developing all these things. <clears throat> so what we need is the entire SNT community in India and industry will need to contribute to this. So we hope that some of the uh, some members in the audience here would be interested in these things. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chaturvedi, for this fascinating uh, you know, talk. You took us through various applications of plasmas with a wonderfully illustrating videos and uh, making an excellent uh, you know, uh, exposure and exposition to various uh, applications of plasmas. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to listen, and there's a lot of things to learn from, uh, from the applications that are going through. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, questions. I, I will now request, uh, you know, uh, my colleague to uh, please take on the uh, questions, please. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Palamaru. I think I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yes. Okay, great. So thank you, Professor Shashank, for this uh, very enlightening and exciting talk. You have really covered, uh, first, the introduction quite beautifully. And then after... Uh, you have, uh, you know, precisely captured the many of the applications as well as the physics perspective of the plasma applications. Thank you so much for this exciting talk. I'm sure there are questions, but before we start the question and session, I would like to request the participants to kindly raise their hands if they are joining through the WebEx to ask the questions. Otherwise, if they, you guys are joining through the YouTube channel, kindly uh, type your questions in the chat box. We will take it from there. So first, I will request our WebEx uh, panel members to kindly raise their hands if they have any questions with the uh, with this conversation with Professor Sashank. So, is there any hand raise? Yeah, Bhala, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Professor Chaturvedi. Wonderful talk. You are showing the uh, accelerator that you are injecting some macromolecules inside the tokamak. What was the velocity? Excuse that... me, Bala, you have to speak louder. It's yeah. not can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, not fine. Yes. Okay, right. So uh, you are showing some of these uh, new things uh, that are being used in the tokamak, especially the macromolecules being injected. Uh, they are particles. They are actually particles, not particles, molecules. Yeah, particles. So uh, what is the maximum velocity that you can achieve? With the electromagnetic accelerator we currently have, it's a multi-stage coil gun. It was actually developed at BRC in Vishakhapatnam we can go up to 600 meters per second. So velocities really, we don't actually need velocities of that type. Typically in the uh, two tokamaks here, SST and Aditya, we need something like 200 meters per second. That's good enough. But if we went to a bigger machine, the 600 would be required. So that's the kind of uh, number we need. OK, 
Okay, and uh, what was the length of this this accelerator? Uh, length pretty small. I mean, these are if it's a two stage or the three stage, it's about this much. Let's say about fifty centimeters or so. That's about it. Okay. The actual the actual barrel part because it is actually multiple stages. So you can de define the number of stages depending on the requirement. But if, suppose I count three stages, it will be something like 30, 40 centimeters. That's about all. Okay, we are we are very much interested to know more about it. So I'll we'll, sure. we'll get back to you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, more questions from uh, the WebEx panel? Yeah, Professor Bharadwaj, please. Thank you, Sanjay. And thank you, Dr. Shrank, uh, for a very highly informative, actually, for all of us, you know, to get educated into many of the areas in which IPR is working. And particularly those which are having uh, applications, not just in the fusion and things like that. And I recollect when you're talking about uh, plasma thrusters uh, development activities going on. If I'm not mistaken, you are mentioning that uh, about 100 millinewton thrusters have been developed already. 80, 70 to 80 is routine. In some cases, by tuning, we've gone up to 90 in this one. But remember, mm -hmm. these are not these are not space compliant thrusters yet. They are just in the lab. So currently, we are trying to understand them, improve them. Okay. Then we we'll start talking to the users to check out the you know modify them, make them compact, low weight, and so on. So that's what I was trying to understand. Whether is there any plan to develop them for the space applications? Because... Sure. Yeah. In fact, uh, on the 24th and 25th, we have organized a, sem a two day seminar at IPR. In, in FCIPT. It's called Plasmas for Space and Aerospace Applications. In fact, uh, Dr. Kakotkar and Dr. Kiran Kumar have kindly consented to uh, come for the inauguration. And we have invited, so they're participants both from ISRO and from the private sector, because you, now you know there's a lot of private sector interest in the space industry. So we have around 45 people from outside who are participating in this and giving talks. So, in fact, the whole point there is to tell people what we have done so far with ISRO. You know that IPR has had a long engagement with ISRO with LPSC, URSC, ERL, of course, and so on, with BSSC and so on. We want to tell people about what we have done, what we are planning to do, and see if we can find collaboration there. That's the whole idea of that meeting. So that is 24, 25. 24 and 25, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bharadwaj. Thank you, Professor Sang. Harish. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I mean, I would uh, have imagined that plasma as an application and releasing the air rate. Uh, am, am I audible? Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, you are audible, Harish, uh, please. I have one uh, technical question. It may be trivial for I mean, in the field people, but uh, uh, you, you mentioned about the graphite uh, plasma torch. Yes. Uh, graphite being a carbon material and it's being heated so high, I mean, why the graphite itself is not getting what burnt does? off uh, in this it process? Was... Pyrolysis, okay, not it won't get burned because we don't have oxygen there. Normally, the we don't feed oxygen because pyrolysis is supposed to be anaerobic. I mean, without oxygen at least. So we feed okay. nitrogen with the gas, but it does it tend to ablate. We lose the graphite. So we have an arrangement that continuously keeps sensing the we have image processing. It keeps looking at the gap between the two electrodes and automatically keeps advancing the electrodes so that the gap is maintained. But we lose it, yes. It's a consumable. Okay. Thank you, Harish. Uh, Professor Pallam Raju. Yes, um, I have actually a couple of uh, queries just to understand what is happening, and that is one is regarding the plasma, you know, in the in the fluid uh, uh, flow that you had shown, laminar flow, and once mm -hmm. you put plasma, that becomes smooth and then otherwise turbulent. So yes, yeah, what what exactly is happening uh, there? How why is it it's becoming laminar? You know, we have a uh, you you might have, must have, might have seen those violet glow. Right. right, whenever we switch it on, whenever the flow is attached. Now, that, that is basically a dielectric barrier discharge. It's one way to produce plasmas. Now, the DBD creates a small flow. Firstly, it creates a high pressure region because you're dumping energy into a plasma. You're creating a plasma and dumping some energy. And the DBD operates at high frequency. So you create a plasma, but it's not, it doesn't draw, it draws a very small amount of overall power. So that plasma modifies the flow pattern in that region. It produces a flow of plasma itself and therefore modifies the airflow. So that's how it works. So it's basically more of a kind of fine neutral collisions happening there that's putting that part, is part of it yes yes part of it exactly exactly oh. but you the geometric arrangement has to be optimized so that you get the right kind of flow so you basically play around with those things so that's why we have some, one person doing simulations for this thing uh, cfd simulations for the plasma source 
and then trying to see how, what is the best arrangement, what's the gap between them and frequency and power levels, which will give the best uh, sort of flow modification. Okay. In fact, this drag reduction actually started not with vehicles, it started with aircraft. That was the main application. So if you look at the publications, mostly in the AIA, there are lots of papers there. There's American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, lots of papers there. The Russians have a lot of literature. They were doing it for aircraft. And they were doing for a lot more things for aircraft, not just uh, drag reduction, also for fast control. The advantage of these plasma discharges, the DBDs, you can control them very fast, right? In milliseconds, you can switch them on and off. So if you can modify the flow, you could use it for, instead of having the control surfaces on an aircraft, could you replace them by DBDs? Okay. So you can get much faster control. So th but we thought we should start with a very down-to-earth thing. You see, for aircraft, who let me test out an aircraft with these things? But it's much easier to test on land vehicles because we could do it ourselves. And probably it'll add to the lesser uh, you know, tolerances in terms of mechanical uh, fabrication. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. Because finally, there'll be power supplies, there'll be other things. On an aircraft, it becomes more demanding. On a land vehicle, weight is not an issue. I can put something there. Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, thank you. And the, the second uh, question was in terms of uh, plasma pyrolysis. Uh, in, and, and especially in the medical, biomedical waste treatment that you are talking about. So, um, what is the, you know, uh, uh, what is its uh, status? It, it, it Can it be, you know, implemented to in different hospitals? Every hospital can have kind of, uh, you know, plant like that? Yes. You see, first in 2016, uh, this was notified in the Gazette of India as an acceptable technique for disposal of biomedical waste. Right. So, it's already cleared. We've cleared the CPCB norms for that. With, with our design for up to a capacity of one ton per day we've already transferred technology to i think five or six partners private partners so up to that scale they can just do it on their own we don't want because you see building things for us takes a lot of time because of our procurement processes so we want them to handle it now we are going for the first time we are going to this five tons per day thing so once this is done for varanasi for the home uh, baba cancer hospital there once this is established and it works reliably, we'll transfer this technology also. So we want industry to do that work. Both and the transfer uh, tech transfer has been both for biomedical waste and for normal, other waste also, organic waste, because you can have waste to energy kind of things as well. Okay. And maybe one uh, last you know, question probably because- Sure, please, I please. Several. And in terms of plasma and nitriding, is there another you know, um, interesting application that you talked about in terms of you know, it reduces corrosion uh, yes. uh, aspects? So, um, so especially that also, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, uh, industries that are taking up there for some constructions, especially in, in the coastal regions and all, or, uh, uh, or, or maybe in the oil gas pipelines also, you know, in fact, we see, especially when you talk about the space weather that we work on, you know, in terms of uh, space plasmas affecting the, affecting our producing current cyanosphere, there are ground-based uh, oil pipelines, they get corroded because of the, of the, of the reverse currents. And uh, uh, and then and then they they have uh, you know the oil pipelines bursting is, is happening and one of the reasons what that was identified was the corrosion of play of, of pipelines on the ground because they produce reverse currents actually. I see. I didn't know about that. That's an interesting one. We'll find out about that. Jacob, I was not aware of this one. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your time and I'm thank sure you. there are many more questions. Thank you. Yeah. Professor. Thank you, Professor Palamraju. Uh, yes, Professor Despande. Thank yeah. you, Sanjay. Uh, Shashangri, thanks. Thanks a lot for this really informative talk. I have one question that what are the techniques available for purification of water, plasma techniques for purification of water? And uh, how does it uh, treat the pathogens, ions, or even for that matter, simple pH? Are there possibilities? We haven't, uh, this PAW that we I talked about, the plasma activated water is not really for purification of water. It's to make the water active for some time, for a few hours or a few days. So then it can be used for disinfection and so on. But it's not to produce the water. And there's a simple matter of economics. Basically, you are anyway able to get pure water at a pretty low rate. Right? If you buy bisleri in bulk, it will come for what, one rupee a liter or something like that. So using a plasma process for that may not be cost effective. And no, no industry will take it if it's not cost effective. But these are uh, what we are targeting are different applications. Because once we produce PAW, either we can supply a plant. I mean, we can make a small plant, give it to someone, he can make them on the spot, or we can supply. So what we found is in working with some collaborator in the dairy industry, now they clean these milk cans. After each time, after you use the milk can, you have to disinfect it on the surface. Because milk otherwise is a very good place for growth of bacteria and so on. So it turned out that normally they use other things. For, they do a spray there, which are costlier. Using plasma activated water, a very small amount, spraying it there can... Uh, do the same level of disinfection. 
so that is one thing we are targeting basically where the cost of the system and of the cost of production becomes economically viable second thing we are seeing is that uh, agriculture thing which is still at the research stage because there's been a phd student who's done his phd work and we are working with one agriculture research university to see if this plasmatic water can improve the germination rate of seeds that is the percentage of seeds that germinate and also the total production of say, chlorophyll or the total green mass that comes out and so on but that's still at the research stage the application to dairy industry we feel it's already been demonstrated at a reasonable level fine thank you thanks thank you professor despande yeah professor banerji um thank you uh, uh, dr Ch uh, chaturvedi for uh, uh, for a detailed uh, talk on plasma fundamentals and applications my question was whether uh, there is any interest in IPR in developing an RPG, basically a radio sort of thermoelectric generator. You know, uh, that is a basic requirement for um, interplanetary missions. So is, is there any interest? I mean, you showed uh, in your uh, future direction slide something related to uh, propulsion, but um, I'm just curious to know whether um, this is also being considered for development. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, the radio part is not some the radi radiological stuff is not something that we can do at IPR because we don't have the expertise. So that would be more appropriately done with BIRC. Right? You would need things like plutonium 238 or some other isotopes which can work there. So I think they would be the right people to work in that. We don't actually work in that area, nor do we have expertise there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Banerjee. We don't have any raised hand, but we have some questions in the chat box, so I will read it for you. Kindly respond to those questions. So, Dr. CBS Dutt is asking, how are the plasma guns are made of material? And the second part is, how the material does not get plasmalized in that process? Mm, sorry, I'm not clear which gun he's talking about. He's talking about the plasma gun. I mean, probably he was speaking about the electron gun or ion gun, something like that. Oh, that was an electron gun. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's def definitely. I mean, there's no plasma in there. The electron gun is a normal electron gun, which you have in so many other applications. And that's anyway not developed at IPR. We have bought an electron gun to use in that high flux test facility. So if that is what we are talking about. Uh, I can't I answer. guess maybe. I guess maybe. So was and it the, the other part? Torch? Was it the plasma torch that he was talking about? Maybe plasma gun, he might be meaning plasma torch in that sense. So in the case of the plasma torch, yes, I already answered one question that the graphite electrode that we use, there's arc struck between say two electrodes or three electrodes, depending on the geometry. The graphite actually keeps sub uh, sublimating. So you keep losing it all the time and you have to keep feeding it to maintain it. And that gets carried away because of the nitrogen feed or some other gas being fed. It sweeps away the stuff. So it okay. actually goes, yes. Okay. The second question from himself as well, the excellent application in the BMW disposal and any plan for MSW treatment and hazardous waste? Yeah. Yeah. So there's two parts. One is MSW, one is hazardous, right? Different things. Yes. So uh, hazardous waste, yes. In fact, some proto early studies had already been done with, I think, one of the DRDO labs, if I'm not mistaken, some years back, because they have quite a lot of hazardous waste produced in the process of produ producing uh, various things. So it was about destroying that. So chemicals of any type, then for example, we made another pyrolysis plant, which has been located at CSMCRI in Bhavnagar, the Central Salt and Marine Chemical Research Institute. So there again, the idea is to dispose of certain things, hazardous chemicals or uh, solvents, which are used industrially to get rid of those. So hazardous waste, yes, absolutely. Municipal solid waste, the problem is segregation. Because the way we get municipal waste, it's all mixed up. You know, the stuff that you dump outside. We ourselves don't segregate for the most part. And then it gets messed up with construction material and stuff like that. Now, the plasma pyrolysis part will work only on the organic part, the inorganic part. But so if you dump the whole thing together, most of my thermal energy will go into the inorganic part, just heating it up to that kind of temperature. Right. So if segregation is done, we can do it. But if you dump the whole thing, it's not economical. That's all. Okay. okay the next question is from Trinesh. Uh... Can plasma technology be used in the space-based technology other than the rocket propulsion somewhere? That is one part. Uh, then I, I mean, rest part I will read later. Maybe you can yeah, go with this. You did here. Used in space-based technology other than rocket propulsion. Yeah. Mm, 
I mean, I showed some of the things. I couldn't show you all the applications. For example, it's already been used for doing certain things for ISRO. Just to give some examples. For example, uh, they wanted to create a low weight antenna. Now, normally antennas are all metallic, so they have a certain weight. We did coatings using plasmas on Lexan, a very thin coating of, say, copper. So you get a very low weight plasma, uh, sorry, antenna, which can also be folded up. So they wanted a foldable lightweight antenna, which we are able to do with plasma coatings. So one example there. So thrusters is one. This kind of coating is one. Nitrating itself. A lot of the inside series of satellites, the, the gaze and so on were nitrated here at FCIPT in Gandhi Nagar. So the gaze used to come here. We used to nitrate them, send them back. In fact, now I think we've supplied one such nitrating system to, I'm not sure, one of the ISRO labs. I, I don't remember which one. So, so that because now they want to do it in-house. We don't want to keep sending us the components. So these are the ones I can think of immediately. I'm sure they are this. And plasma antennas maybe. Plasma antennas maybe. In fact, one of the private sector space startups that we talked to was interested in plasma antennas. It was lightweight antennas, rapidly configurable antennas for space communication. Okay. So other part of the question is, can controlled plasma fusion reactors be made on moon? Because moon is atmosphere-less and pressure is very low. Yes, but first we let's do it on Earth. Is it difficult to know? <laughs> <laughs> let's do it here, then we'll take it there. So it's doing anything <laughs> there. Where's the energy infrastructure to? Okay. Okay. Can power produce production using plasma be a suitable option for the in situ exploration of lunar pluralism? I think you have already answered it. Same point. Okay. Yeah. Next question is from uh, Aditya Sharda. Uh, what kind of test facilities are available at IPR to test the spacecraft potential for a payload going to fly in a LEO orbit plasma? which requires a plasma density of 10 raised to 3 to 10 raised to 7 per cc mm -hmm. and temperature of 0.1 electron volt. Okay. I know that we have a facility at FCIPT, which was actually set up as part of ISTRO projects. It's called SPICS, Space Lab, mm -hmm. Space Lab Plasma Interaction Experiment. The SPICS, mm -hmm. those SPICS 1, then SPICS 2, and currently SPICS 3 is being uh, configured. Mm -hmm. What I would suggest is I can give you the, uh, if you just send me mail and put you in touch directly with the person who's doing it. Even mm -hmm. better, if you can attend the seminar on the 24th and 25th, either online or physically, whatever you like, uh, uh, there'll be talks on this thing and you can directly interact with the concerned people. Yeah, I also think there are plenty of experiments based on the dusty plasma experiments that are taking place in the IPR. So probably that could be helpful for you as well. Absolutely. Anyway, so... Uh, yeah, so uh, there is no more question I can see, but uh, you have a, still a chance to raise hands or type the questions for a couple of minutes more. I have a very quick question. I will just follow the Bhala's question. What is the particle size you have injected into the medium? I mean, into the plasma chamber? Okay, uh, now again, it depends on the application. In this case, what we were doing, because normally this coil gun mm -hmm. has been made for some other application. It's not for mm -hmm. this thing at all. We just adapted it here. So normally the, the diameter of the thing of, of the gun is something like 25 or 30 mm. 30 so we actually mm. have aluminum, what we it is it is like a sabo. You know, like in a gun, you have a discardable sabo. Mm. So the sabo itself will be 25 to 30 millimeters. We can make it bigger also, or, or slightly right. smaller. Mm. Now inside that you can put whatever you like. In this case, okay. this was mm. lithium titanate powder is available in IPR, and we're just doing a demonstration. We just put that in. Mm -hmm. So this was small mm -hmm. particles. I don't remember the sizes, but it will probably be a range of sizes, micron, tensor microns, maybe even 100 microns. But okay, basically, anything can fill inside mm -hmm. that. It can be shot inside. Uh, what is the uh, process of this, uh, uh, you know, il illumination of this material? It is uh, because of the, what is called the, uh, the heating process is the uh, reason for this uh, lightning oh, yeah. or some yeah. other reason? You mean why did they become luminous once yeah. they, got, they got inside yeah, the they become luminous. Yeah. Because, it's because of acceleration or a heating process? No. It's just heating by the plasma. Because the plasma oh, okay. has a large heat flux on it. So that tends to okay. vaporize. And then you'll get line emission okay. from the lithium and the titanium and the oxygen. So these are line okay. emission using the visible part of it. Okay. Uh, the other question was that, uh, that's a very, very, you know, nice question. But why did we choose to make first reactor in France only? Was there any strategic importance of France or something else? I think that was some worldwide thing because, you know, the major partners are the US, Russia, China, South Korea, Japan, mm -hmm. EU. So mm -hmm. there was some a discussion between them, a lot of discussion between them and they settled on one. So it had to be somewhere. Okay. I Great think everyone, everyone wanted it, but mm -hmm. <laughs> settled on one place. 
Okay, so I don't see any further question or raise hands in the uh, our meeting. So uh, thank you so much, Professor Shashank, and uh, I will now hand it over the session to Bhala for a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Professor Chaduvedi. It is indeed an honor for all of us to hear from the pioneer in the field in India. And thank you once again for an informative and wonderful talk with a lot of schematics, photographs, and videos. As mentioned by our director and dean, it is a very educative talk, and there is a lot of lessons to learn from your talk. Thank you. Indeed, thanks to the audience for all the questions. And thanks to the audience on the WebEx platform and YouTube. I would also like to thank the director and dean, chair and co-chair, members of the Amruti ICANN committee, Bushit, and all the technical team members. So thank you all for the efforts and help to the success of the Amruti ICANN. Thank you all. With this, we come to the end of the 67th Amruti ICANN. Please stay tuned for the 68th Amruti ICANN, which will be next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shashanki.